at the end of the day, running a company that's based around values and purpose is an extraordinary filtering mechanism for who even comes into the door. Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, you get my conversations with peak performing thought leaders, creatives, and entrepreneurs. We explore how you can innovate through creativity, compassion, and collaboration. I believe that innovation combined with compassion and creative thinking can save the world, and I aim to bring you ways you can do it too. If you're enjoying the show, I'd be super grateful if you can support it by buying me a cup of coffee. You can buy me a cuppa at buymeacoffee.com slash Isolde T. And now, let's get on with the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg. I'm super happy that you're here and listening to this incredible episode. I'm also incredibly happy to introduce you to this week's guest. Vikas Garg is the founder and CEO of A Billion, a global community on a mission to help a billion people create world-changing impact. You know that's right, what I'm gonna love talking about. Vikas is a dedicated supporter of education and conservation initiatives around the world. He's received Credit Suisse's Global Citizenship Award, is a young leader of the Milken Institute and a charter member of the Indus Entrepreneurs. He's amazing, and he had a bold idea to change the world, and that is exactly what he and his team are working on. I'm so thrilled to welcome Vikas Garg. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Zelda. How are you? I am fabulous. Thank you so much for asking. I, I wanted, I want, first of all, I want to say that you, I, I am in New York City, and you are in Singapore, so it is in the evening for me and it is the very next day in the morning for you and that's that I, that, that was a little trippy for me so I, <laughs> I was like oh yeah it's tomorrow for you uh so and for you it's today and i'm i'm here back here and yesterday so You're i yesterday that's right i am i am so <laughs> honored and excited to have you on the show actually because Anybody who knows me for any length of time will hear me talk about being vegan and being plant, what I call plant powered. And I, I want to sort of lift up this notion that you have of changing the world and that a billion is about something that's really close to my heart. It's about getting one billion people to commit to being plant-based by the year 2030. And I was wondering, what started this for you? What made you decide that this was going to be your mission? Oh, great question. And and thanks. Uh, firstly, thank you for having us on the show. Thank you for having me on the show. My pleasure. Um, and it's always, always nice to, to, to talk to a fellow New Yorker. Yay. Um, I've been living out here in Singapore for the last six years, but um, grew up in New York City. And uh, uh, just uh, uh, immense gratitude for for having us on the show today. Um, yeah, so you know, I found uh, so as a New Yorker, I, I, and I originally came to New York when I was four years old from India. And uh, one of the things that my mom and dad did um, to really, in a way, to preserve our culture and our heritage, um, there were many things that we did. <clears throat> you know, including just like we used to speak Hindi at home, but we also stayed sort of tried and true to our vegetarianism mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, from, from the day that I was born, um, I was raised vegetarian and growing up in New York in the eighties, um, you know, like being vegetarian meant that like pretty much my entire food pyramid often was like a slice of pizza. It was mm -hmm. like the easiest thing to pretty much get everywhere. And like, you kind of, you know, you could, sort of as a kid know what you were getting get like a slice of cheese pizza mm -hmm. um, or a bagel with cream cheese and I grew up so I grew up vegetarian I grew up never eating meat um, and so and I grew up a big animal lover even a bug lover and it was just something that I got from my mom and dad um, it was a really big part of our culture so you know fast forward um, in my 20s I decided I wanted to go vegan and that was due to a number of different reasons uh, both my mom and dad got sick, really, really, really sick. Um, and I started to look at like, why are two very, very seemingly healthy people getting so sick, like getting things like heart disease and, mm. and, and cancer. 
And a lot of what at the time I started to look at, a lot of it just started to point to food. Hmm. Um, I also just other factors kind of involved in that. And, and I, I basically, I went vegan. And what for me, even as a vegetarian felt very hard at the time, because it meant that it meant giving up a lot of the things that I had come to love, right? It meant mm. like giving up on, on things like cheese and, you know, and especially when you're talking about certain kinds of cuisines, foods, whether it's mm-hmm. Italian food or Indian food, you know, there's, there's butter and everything. There's, there's, you know, there's eggs and everything, there's dairy mm-hmm. and everything, there's cheese and nearly everything. Right. And, and it just felt like a huge compromise. And I was already sort of the weird, you know, the, the, I was already the guy that whenever I went out with all my friends had to ask like two questions to make something vegetarian. And now I was the guy that had to ask five questions mm-hmm. to make something vegan. For sure. You know, and and so <laughs> it was, it, it really very much, it really in the beginning felt like a compromise and a sacrifice mm-hmm. for me. Um, fast forward, I'd say that this idea of me going vegan has probably been one of the defining influence is one of the defining factors in my life and one of the things that's created immense joy and immense positivity and immense mindfulness and really given me so much confidence and control over my life um and it's something that has gone from being sacrificial and compromising to something that's just truly an inspired way of living that helps me feel incredibly connected to everything, incredibly connected to the earth, and incre- more connected to other people, um, you know, very, very, very sort of, I'd say, clued into who I am and giving me a sense of purpose and values and that every single day, every single choice I make is has that connection, has that little connection back to my values, which gives me a lot of confidence in life because I'm leading a life full of purpose and values. So that was, you know, when just going back to your question as to sort of how did I come about this is I finally had, you know, sort of the opportunity in my life. I finally felt like I had gotten to the stage where I was ready to start a company. Um, and I had a career. I didn't have a, this. Uh, we're effectively we're a technology company, but I, I, I didn't have a career in tech. I had a career in finance mm. um, and I. You know, I just felt like, okay, I, I'm going to make this, I've I made this decision and I'm going to start my own thing. And I just looked around and I just was like, you know, I spent my entire career, my entire life, 15, 16 years working in an industry, but I had, I was going to sort of pers- do what I was going to do now for them. I had the opportunity to do something for the next 30 or 40 years. And I had an opportunity to really choose what that thing was, Right. So it started to really feel like, wow, I'm still, even though I've been doing something my entire life, I still feel like I'm, I'm, I'm in the early stages of the rest of my life. And what do I want to do with it? And so, you know, I, I, at the time, I just felt like there was really an opportunity to improve social media, to improve the whole landscape of e-commerce, um, to build something that was more inspiring and impactful, um, you know, and I, th- I really felt like social media was broken, that social media was this sort of failed experiment. It was this great connector of people, but then it, it, it you know, these communities around the world had formed and some of them had become extremely toxic. Mm. Um, and, you know, clearly we, we, you can see what happened, you know, the 2016 election uh, or even in the last election, right? And many, many other events that happen in society every single day that, mm-hmm. you know, that, that, that social media is, is, has sort of become responsible for. And I just felt like, you know, look, there's, there's an opportunity to create something that actually improved people's lives and improve people's lives and actually stood for something. So that's been the grand experiment for us. I just felt like if we could create something and bring people together in a community and then we could inspire them and make it easier for people, to around the world to live in a more sustainable way uh, and remove sort of the barriers. And, you know, part of those barriers are, you know, when you go out to eat, some of them are when you go shopping, some of them are when you travel, some of them are just sort of when you're, you know, when you're, when you're out and about in your day-to-day lives and said, Hey, and some of them involve just having support 
in your community, right? Because you may not have that support in your community. So we really wanted to create this kind of community, an online community, a community that, you know, people around the world really could join and feel supported in this journey towards a more sustainable world, a more vegan world. And we felt that this idea of going vegan, whether it's all the time or even just consciously making an effort to be more vegan some of the time um, was a huge step in the right direction for the world. Um, and that was something that was worth fighting for. And then that's sort of how it got started about three and a half years ago. Wow. <laughs> I feel like you should just go and mic drop and that's it. Uh, yeah. Wow. I'm taking all of that in everything that you said. And there's so, there's so much, there's so much wealth that you've talked about and that isn't necessarily monetary wealth, that feeling of being connected that feeling of having that confidence. I, I love that what you have chosen is to be purposeful with the work that you're doing, because you could have done another app on time management, you could have done another app on, you know, this is how you buy stocks or whatever, but but you turned it on its head and you went, No, I'm going to do something that means something and use all my skills to do it. And so when you when you talked about the sort of early days when you were growing up and how you had to, you know, I'll have a slice of cheese pizza. Things have evolved. Things have changed. And now we can get there. There are so many restaurants that are vegan only, for example. So so within that framework, within that framework of, of things evolving, what role do you see a billion playing as things move forward? Because I know you've got this 2030 time frame, but what role do you see a billion playing in addition to yourself in making that? go even further than it otherwise might. Yeah, sure. So we start, <clears throat> excuse me, so we start with um, the idea of consumer advocacy first, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you take data? How do you take consumer data and really use it to actually improve the world? So we're obviously in a, a big part of what we are is an online experience, but that online experience, experience of course, extends into the offline world and often it extends into something that we all love, which is to eat, mm -hmm. right? And the, the funny thing is, this is something that we do three, four times a day. Um, and it plays such a pivotal role in the global economy in, uh, in in so many, so many aspects of our lives, but also from a sustainability perspective. So for us, uh, we started with this idea that, hey, like people are gonna, you know, people, people get on our app um, they, they network with each other. They kind of, you know, they follow each other. Um, they use the app to find great vegan options. They can be vegan dishes at any kind of restaurant anywhere in the world. And we kind of gamify the whole process. We don't focus just on vegan restaurants or vegetarian restaurants, but we've really said, Hey, like if we're going to actually, if the world is going to become a lot more sustainable through vegan food, what we really need to do is create a, create a business, create a company that helps the world helps all of the world's businesses create more vegan food and popularize that amongst people. Mm -hmm. So that's really, a, that's a big part of what we do is we do a lot of consumer advocacy. So when, for example, if you went to a restaurant today, you took a photo of your vegan dish, right? That review then just go, then goes into the app, but it doesn't stop there. Our team then goes and figures out who's the owner of that business manager of that business, et cetera. And then we get that review back to those business owners. We not only do that, but if we're talking about it, let's say it's a Japanese restaurant in Midtown Manhattan, we're then going to send that restaurant all of the best rated vegan Japanese dishes, information of reviews, op options, information to show them. And, and for many, many different restaurants around New York City and around the world, we might send them the best rated vegan Japanese dishes from Tokyo. And the whole reason we do that from a consumer advocacy perspective is we want to show them that there's this global movement brewing. We want to show them that there's an, there's an economic opportunity in having great vegan options. And if we can really have that conversation with that business that, Hey, it makes sense to have three, four or five, six, 10, you know, to have 20, 30% of your, of your menu being plant-based, then we actually really start to move the needle when you start to think about sustainability. If we could get thousands of restaurants in a, in a, in a geography to actually start thinking this way 
and shifting from, you know, let's say one vegan dish or one vegetarian dish, if you're even lucky, to having 10%, 20%, then 30% of their menus be plant-based will make a really, really big impact for everybody and everything that's kind of involved in the global food system, including the animals and the land, and the environment and people, of course. So that's really, in a way, that's that's a big part of the role that we want to play, which is consumer advocacy, working on behalf of the consumer to give you a sense of it. Last year, we sent more than 5 million emails all around the world uh, with this kind of information and that sort of competitive landscape, really trying to, in a way, create a meritocracy mm-hmm. for the whole plant-based industry, trying to say, hey, hey, steakhouse, right? Like, there are people who will go to a steakhouse um, and eat, right? If they have a great vegan option. And, you know, ironically uh, in my career, that's exactly what I used to have to do because Mm -hmm. I was a banker in New York and, you know, I'd have clients come from other parts of the United States and I'd, 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 they'd want to go to, you know, some of one of the famous steakhouses in New York, like Peter Luger in Brooklyn. And, you know, I'd be sitting there as the vegetarian and then the vegan and, (laughs) I'd always have this, you know, I'd have this awkward moment where it was like, okay, I've, I'm getting tomatoes and I'm getting some asparagus <laughs> and I'm getting some broccoli, all things that I really love, right? Like, cause like, I'm very much like, I, I, I more than anything, I love, well, I love my pasta, but mm-hmm. I like more than anything, I love my whole plant-based sort of, you know, foods. And I just would always be having these conversations mm-hmm. with restaurant owners, be like, hey, look, like. I, I wouldn't mind coming back here and bringing my parents and bringing up friends, right? But like, can you have one or two really great options for me, right? And often that feedback, they would respond to it, right? And, and you know, overwhelmingly, we felt like, okay, if we could do this at some scale, then that would be really great. If we could leverage technology to do this instead of door-to-door activism, if we could leverage technology to do this on a much larger scale, we could really move the needle. And so today, if you look at just with restaurants and there's a whole other side to our platform, which is um, which is you know purely from like a consumer review perspective, it's consumer products. And today we have 160,000 consumer products across about 40,000 brands on our platform. I'll get to that later, but like the, uh, you know, when you look at just the restaurant side of it, today we have about 50,000 restaurants on our platform globally, about 65% of them receive this kind of information from mm-hmm. us. Sometimes mm-hmm. sometimes it's just impossible to you know, find out any information about a business if the business is sitting in Vietnam or maybe in Thailand or in Argentina, for example, right? It, it just sometimes is, is a bit difficult, but mm-hmm. generally we're able to find that information more than half the time. Um, And we've seen tremendous results. When we first started here in Singapore uh, three and a half years ago, Um, and we day one, we started sort of as a global app, but we had zero content. We had zero users. We started with zero users, zero content, you know, and and built it up from there. But when we got first got started um, and Singapore is probably because we're here, because the company's here and all of our team is here, you know, this is one of our most engaged markets globally Mm -hmm. when we first got started here in singapore i think in our first year we found that there were like less than a thousand vegan options available Mm -hmm. on restaurant menus right Mm -hmm. at restaurants on our platform and that number like we just did our second annual singapore top 50 vegan dish awards Mm -hmm. right and it's funny because like 40 of those restaurants that are on that list you know, of the 50, and it's not 50, <clears throat> it's not 50 restaurants, it's 50 dishes, because mm-hmm. we really think that that's what people, you know, people care about what they're eating, what's on their plate more than anything these days. Mm-hmm. But like, the, of the 50 dishes, I think around 40, at least 40 of those restaurants are, are not vegan or vegetarian restaurants. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're just, we, we, we just did that. And today, thanks to a lot of the work that we've done, a lot of the work that a lot of other organizations, companies, et cetera, people have done. We've gone from, in the last three, four years, we've gone from a thousand vegan dishes on menus to 16,000. Yes, that's um, great. And, you know, so that's pretty awesome. Like, and it's a huge honor, of course, where, you know, you pick the top 50 from 16,000. It's 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 quite a big honor, right? Mm-hmm. So 
we're seeing restaurants respond to that. And like, you know, people get our frame certificates and very meat heavy restaurants who would have never thought that they were getting, you know, they were going to get an award from a vegan company, a vegan organization. And they're so delighted, you know, they frame it, they put it right up next to their wine spectator award. And, and, you know, and, and what ends up happening is they create more, plant-based options and they mm-hmm. start talking about them. And then those, those things get started, you know, those order, they get ordered. And that's really ultimately what creates impact, mm-hmm. right? Because that larger pool of businesses around the world that, you know, we know are never going to, they're likely not going to become vegan businesses. Um, but there's a real opportunity that if we can get them to sort of shift to 20, 30, 40% vegan, that's going to make a massive impact Mm -hmm. for everything that we care about. So that's a big role that we play. Obviously we need to grow. Like we, we want to grow our user base. We want to grow our membership around the world. Our community is really strong right now. And it's in a hundred plus countries. Um, And we just want to grow that and continue building. Um, And as the community gets stronger and the use case gets stronger and the, 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 our sort of product, which is our app, gets better and better and better, that impact that we make uh, sort of on people in terms of being able to sort of guide people and show them. And, you know, you mentioned like you're getting like, I think that, you know, I've liked a couple of your posts and stuff like that. And it's, I was talking to one of our members in Vancouver uh, two, three weeks back. And she was telling me how like she became vegan a year ago there's a farm animal sanctuary on Vancouver Island that we support. It's called Rasta. Mm-hmm. And uh, she got a flyer about the sanctuary from a friend of hers. And she said, you know, I'm like, this is interesting. You know, I, maybe I should cut down my meat consumption. And she ended up, the, the, the sanctuary talks about us um, as, you know, a great tool for that. And so she started using our app about a year ago. And now she and her entire family have become 100% vegan. Nice. Um, and you know, not only have they become vegan, but they're trying out foods from around the planet. So because they're able to see well, like people in Singapore or other parts of Asia or parts of Europe and South America are eating, there's a feed and she, her whole family has gotten inspiration for cooking and trying new things. And, you know, and it's, it, she's felt that it's a very, very supportive, positive community that really backs her up that when she posts something, right. Um, whether she makes something at home using, you know, a plant-based meat product and she takes a photo of it. Um, when she posts something, uh, she sees all these comments and she sees all of this engagement and she's built this community and it really feels very supportive and it's really helped her continue on her journey and path to being vegan. And we love that. Like, I love that. That is, that is, in a way, that is the biggest thing that we can do from an impact perspective is how do we help people and support people on this journey? We know it's hard, right? We know it's not perfect. It's not about perfection, but it's about how do you provide a really supportive community that just rallies behind everybody and supports each other? And that's really the big shift that we see that we want to see happening in social media as well. So super, super excited about that. And, um, and, you know, really just trying to trying to build that up and trying to really help people sort of create impact and feel good about creating impact. Um, We have a lot of sort of work around that that we're doing, but um, we I think we we do a pretty good job of it today. And and it's been amazing to to kind of to to kind of see it grow and where it's going to go in the next eight, nine, 10 years. I can't, you know, I, I can't tell you, but we're we're all working hard towards that goal of a billion people. I love that goal. I'm I'm 110% behind you. A billion percent if you will. You know what what's interesting about what you said and there's so much there's you know you, you're talking and I'm going, "Yes, this, I need to ask about this and I need to ask about this." And and the thing that that struck me so hard as you were talking I've I've had that happen. The I go to a restaurant and I have to pick the vegetables that I'm going to ask you to put together. And I go, you know, can you put this together in a salad or can you saute these for me in some oil and some garlic, blah, blah, blah. What's often happened is that the chef, and I've had this happen several times, the chef comes out and goes, 
You know, I've never thought of putting these together like that. Do you mind if this is tomorrow's special? No, I do not mind if this is tomorrow's special. And I've actually had <laughs> dishes that I've sort of put together like that end up on the permanent menu of restaurants. And amazing. Yeah, it's really it's it's very it was one of them was called the Isolde salad, which I thought was just hilarious. <laughs> uh, but but uh, but the reason I'm bringing this up is because it was a it was a perception shift, I guess, for the chef. So that notion of we can change not just the consumer's percept perceptions, but the people who are actually running the restaurants or making the food, their perception that it's possible to make vegan food that is good for you and all of that, but also that is scrumptious, that is really delicious. Uh, that people want, that people want. Right. So, so, so how... How do we do that I, I, on a on a and and maybe this isn't part of a billions <clears throat> mission, but how do we do that on a bigger scale? Because yes, I've I've had the Isolde salad uh, become part of of this Italian restaurant's permanent menu, but but what do what can we do as as people who might be on a billion or people who might not yet know about it, but now of course you do, so go and get the app. But how? What can we do to change the perception of the people in the industry? Like, I see that you're doing the the mailings to the restaurants. Is there anything else that we can be doing? And if so, what do you think that is? Yeah, look, I think that we all, I think that we all can be really great advocates, right? So anybody who's listening in on this on this podcast, um, you know, can be a voice, right? And I think that that's one of the most powerful things that you can do is communicate with people. Um, often, like, I mean, I, I, in, in Asia specifically, uh, when I got here six years ago, one of the things that <clears throat> I saw was, you know, people, a lot of people, when you go to a place, just kind of accept the status quo for what it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and so you just end up, you either, you, you just search and you try to find places that have things that you want um, or things that you can have and you accept things as the way it is a little bit more. Um, and we just really wanted to change that. Right. Um, but at the same time, like you in a place like New York, right. Where I'd say that, you know, in a place like America where businesses are much more likely to adapt and try to do anything they can to, you know, to, to please a customer, um, and ensure that person's happy. Um, you know, we have, we all have a voice. And so the best thing that anyone can do is, you know, is, hey, like, you know, be a voice, be a voice for the movement, right? Um, always ask the question and try to have that conversation when you can and try to be really positive about it, right? So I think that sometimes what happens and, and you know, it's, it's always, it's hard to generalize. I don't like generalizing, but I think that sometimes what happens is uh, some of the, some of the ways that we sort of go about having a voice sometimes are not, uh, sometimes can be a bit, bit more argumentative than they mm -hmm. are helpful. And mm -hmm. I think it's just a matter of sort of, you know, tone and it's a matter of, um, of, 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 of casting sort of what we're doing, what we want in a very positive way and reinforce it very positively. I know that the, the challenges with social issues, right, is there's so much on the line right mm. um and it's so personal um and i you know so so for me like i grew up as an activist um since the time that i was a kid in new york and i went to my first PETA rally when i was just seven or eight years old you know and and I kind of always been clued into sanctuaries and you know and 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 i and so i i, I grew up in sort of around this and i was also like i was a constant debater and i was on the debate team and you know, and I just, what I have found is that debate for the sake of debate um, and, you know, or, or, or this like that you need to be right sort of mentality often ends up putting you in a box. Um, mm. And I, and, and what you want it, sometimes we forget about, well, what is it that we want and what's maybe the most effective way to get what we want. Um, and often I would just say that at least what I've learned, I've, I just turned 40 is if you can just have a, if you can have a pleasant conversation with somebody that usually does it, that that can usually do the trick or at least plant a seed um so yeah i think that's something that all we all can do and of course like you know uh 
uh, please, like, of course, you know, folks can get on the, get on the app. Like we're really building this social community around this sort of positive messaging and consumer advocacy. Um, and, you know, give it a shot, try it out. Um, because not only will whatever work or whatever time you invest in this help you and it'll be fun because it's fun. Uh, just, you know, social media has to be fun. It's, it's meant to be enjoyable um, for whatever amount of time you spend on it every day. But then not only that, it, but it also creates a lot of impact in the world and a lot of positive social change. And that's really why we designed it is really to give everybody, even people who are not necessarily comfortable, you know, going around and sort of speaking and doing that, or maybe you're just too busy, an opportunity to just do something fun and gamify that, do something fun and still make a lot of positive change in society. I like that you combine both of them. That's that's wonderful. And it's interesting what you were talking about being positive. The 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 app definitely feels it feels very upbeat. It feels very positive. It feels like I'm contributing to something when I when I leave a review and I and I love that. And and yet I was telling somebody about it who was not vegan and the response I got was Ugh, another vegan thing, you know, <laughs> and, and that's that yeah, I'm not always positive when I talk about it because I get I get into that whole billions of animals are slaughtered every year mindset very quickly. So it's hard for me to stay positive when that is in the forefront. And yet uh, when I'm talking about the app to people who are already either vegan friendly or vegan themselves, it's a really positive experience. And I'm getting people to sign up and go, oh, this is cool. When I talk about it to non-vegans, there's a there's an eye roll. And so what is your what is your thought? How how is it best to talk about these subjects? And you said positive, and that's great. And yet, if there, if you immediately meet sort of a wall of resistance, is it just a, okay, you're not a person I can talk about this with? Or do you have any strategies yeah. to talk to people yeah. about it? Yeah, and, and, and just, you know, just to clarify, like when I say positive, I, you know, I can imagine some of my friends uh, who are very passionate activists, their eyes rolling, because it, it's like, it's it, what I'm, what I don't mean, you know, like what I don't mean, like, you know, it, it wouldn't be cool for like, we all know, okay, like racism, right. Let's just take racism, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no, like, we're all like trying to like, from, from like a, a vegan activist perspective. Right. Um, um, if I was to wear my, my sort of, you know, my, my, my activism hat for a second. Right. I would, it's not, I would say that it's not cool it's not cool to kill a little less, right? Like mm -hmm. I would say something like that, like, you know, and, and we would, I'd say that most people, if you ask them, is it okay to be a little racist? They'd be like, no, what are you talking about? Like, mm -hmm. that's not, that's not cool. Like you can't be a little racist. And so it's like, you know, I would make the argument that says, well, so you're saying, is it, it's okay to kill a little, right? It's like, they'd be like, no, it's not okay to kill a little, but that's what you do every single day when you, you know, you eat animals and things like that. So like, I, that sort of positive, I, I guess that's not, the, the, that idea of sort of positive messaging, just for it, what I mean by that is you've got to, you, I, what I have found that works the best is sort of being able to relate to people, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. we can talk about, all of the animal lives. And when you start talking about things like in the billions, often people kind of zone out right. because it, it just, it takes somebody out of their immediate sort of day-to-day -day life. But when mm -hmm. you can talk to somebody in a way that really connects with them on a personal basis, and the best way to do that is to tell your own personal story. Mm -hmm. um, and really like, why are you doing this? And how does it impact you? And really, I'd say that that's probably the thing that I have found, you know, it doesn't always work, but that's what I, at least when I come at it from a very, very personal way, and I talk about my own health, and I talk about my mom and dad, and I talk about, you know, I talk about my dog, uh, hmm. for instance, um, and I talk about the changes that I felt and the struggles that I had, um, you know, that then becomes a very personal story 
And while somebody may not agree with it, they're uh, probably a, a, a lot more willing to just kind of accept it or recognize that, okay, cool. I, I, I get, get what this person is about. And that's like, that's their journey. And I respect that. Right. So then like, you know, at least you sort of, I think you establish a foundation, which you can then build on from there because a the person at least appreciates where you're coming from. Some people will of course never be receptive or be open-minded. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, like we, we, we live in a world where you know, there's a lot of, there, you know, human beings are, are very complex and, intellectually emotionally mentally physically we're also very 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 diverse and you're not going to convince everybody and that's you know there, I, I don't know if there's you know it's really about that well it's a, it's for you it's about a billion which i think is good and and more than a billion would be even better i i that's for sure it's it, it, what's interesting that feeling of connection that you talked about earlier is similar to what I heard you say just now that that it is on it's meeting people where where they are with where you are and I and I totally respect that. And yet when I when I think about it I'm going okay so there are all these benefits that you that you have sort of wrought if you will you've wrought all these benefits from being vegan and yet I don't know, do you sometimes feel like you're tilting at windmills or do you see enough potential that it that it's worth it to keep going? Well, definitely, I mean, I definitely see a lot of potential. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of things. Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't work. Mm. Um, sometimes they don't work in the short term and uh, often there is sort of this sense it's very easy when you've got a whole room full of people to like constantly be pivoting or changing their mind. And often the, the hardest thing to do is to stay on tack. The hard, one of the hardest things to do is, is really believe in what you're doing mm -hmm. and believe in something that maybe not a lot of other people really see as, um, as valuable. Um, and, you know, look, you've got to take it in. You've got to like, you've got to really analyze it. You've got to do your work. Um, um, but you've also got to have conviction in things in life. Mm -hmm. And, and that's sort of the hardest, I'd say that's one of the hardest things um, sometimes uh, because you could talk to five different people and get five different opinions. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's just the way that you ask a question um, you know, where, you know, you're, you're almost setting yourself up to, to get a certain kind of response. So it's really, it's, it's, I think it's about, I think it's about having, I think a lot of it is about having conviction and then really thinking, at least for us, like thinking about like, okay, well, how do we build a business and how do we, in some, to some degree, stay grounded in the way that business works? Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, you're trying to create a new kind of business in an, in an industry that, you know, is evolving, but not a lot of people are sort of accepted yet. Um, but you think it's the future. Um, and so it's, it's hard. It's really, really, really hard. Um, but, but it's also really fun and it's rewarding. And, you know, it's, it's when, when you do have your wins, it feels really, really great and special. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny. Uh, I there are people who've known me forever and a day, and one of the first things that they ask me when they see me again after not having seen me for a while is, "So, are you eating meat yet?" And <laughs> it's 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 as if they think it's it's a temporary thing. And I'm like, it's been over thirty years. I think I'm I think I'm done. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that thing that you said about confidence. There is there is a there is a power in my mind to standing in your truth you know my truth for me i'm never i'm never eating animals or any animal products again i don't use animal products although that's my truth and you said earlier that you feel a greater sense of confidence since you have gone vegan and i would love it if you could talk a little bit about what the flavor of that is what is the root of that and and how do you see it playing out in the way you've innovated this entire social media space? 
Um, sorry, Isolde, could you repeat that question? <laughs> Did your daughter walk I into got, the room? <laughs> yeah, I got the, I got the first, I got, sorry, she knocked on the door. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. She knocked on the door. I heard, I heard, the, I heard the first part of it, but then I wasn't, I'm not, I wasn't clear about the No worries, the question, no worries. I love it. Well, the question so part sorry. of it. No, 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 that's great. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it, this is about, it. it's funny. I, uh, the podcast got into uh, the fourth edition of Podcasting for Dummies. It actually was, was featured in the book and it was featured in the Slice of Life podcast area. So <laughs> that's, a, because that's what this is. Things happen. This is a slice of life. So the question was actually about uh, how your level of confidence has suffused your ability to innovate in in the social media space, which has innovation things like you know TikTok or whatever. But this is this is innovation with a purpose, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your level of confidence relates your ability to go to I don't know if you have sponsors or if you have investors, but your ability to go to people who don't ha know anything about this, who don't know anything about veganism, and be confident enough to go, this is a really cool thing, and this is why you want to be part of it. Yeah, look, you know, you have to turn over a lot of stones. It's very competitive. Mm. Um, and depending on who you talk to, one person's uh, sort of one person's gauge of success looks very different than another person's gauge of success. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the, the thing about, you know, the thing about the space is there's, there's, you just you have to you have to find you have to you know you have to do the work and you have to you have to find the people who are going to support you whether it's financially and we're very much a venture backed company um at this stage um you know and and our revenues uh you know if 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 tomorrow our funding just completely dried up our revenues definitely wouldn't support what we're what we are doing mm -hmm. and building we're not a very cap we're not a very capital intensive business at this stage mm -hmm. we will become a more capital intensive business at this stage and so it's really again it's setting yourself up for thinking okay like well what does this business really look like over the next three four five years what are we building um and uh and really being able to communicate that effectively and meet the folks and build relationships with people and 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 yeah and convey convey that sense of confidence but behind that sense of confidence it can't just be that <laughs> you know behind that sense of confidence there also has to be work and a plan and a and, and being able to sort of describe and show and build all the things that we need to do in order to make our business, you know, fundamentally sound and sustainable um, so we can be in business in the next 20, 30 and 50 years. And get let alone the, the next two. <laughs> yeah. Let alone right. the next sort of two. Right. Right. Which, you know, which, which it really is. It's like, it's like you want to build yourself for long-term success, but you've got to really think about like, well, okay, how are you going to survive? in the next one year or in the next two years. Um, especially I'd say that until you get to the stage where you have a hit product, mm -hmm. right? And that takes time, you know, with some of the, the biggest companies in the food space that that's, you know, that's taken them before, before everybody, you know, in America had heard about the Beyond Burger, you know, it was mm -hmm. even, it, even well before it was even the Beyond Burger it was called something else. And that company had been around for, for almost a decade by the time, you know, people really started to kind of, it started to go mainstream. And so while, you know, while folks like Ethan and the people around him had that vision, they also were very smart about executing and building. And I'm sure, you know, while they were thinking about what 10 years ahead were, that was probably very early on in the business, they were probably mm -hmm. just thinking about what the next six months looks like. Mm -hmm. So there is always that sort of, you know, there's always that sort of, and I don't think that it's a, I don't think that it's an inherent conflict. I just think that it's a responsibility to, to be thinking about, well, you know, what do you need to do short term? What do you need the next three, six months and nine months and 12 months to look like, right? What do you need to build? How do you get the, you know, you, how do you, how do you build something, um, you know, short term, get that to scale and, you know, what's the long-term vision of this and are the things that you're doing right now matching up with 
the long-term vision for the company. It's a lot of it's a huge balancing act, I imagine, and also just a lot a lot of balls in the air. So you're you're a juggler on a on a unicycle, it sounds like. Uh, and my husband is a clown. He was a clown in the circus, so I, I know of what I speak. <laughs> uh, what's I'm curious about the how do I put this? You're, it's it feel it really does feel to me like you have a foot in several worlds like you have the foot in the activist world but you also have to have a foot in the sort of bottom line financial interests world and what where what is the line there what what when you have to make a decision based on what's best for the company what's best for the bill for a billion what's best for you know the in your mind what's best for the planet the animals etc where do you fall how do you navigate that when you have to make those decisions? Well, I think that we have a very strong sort of core set of values, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think it all starts there. So one of the great things about running a company that's built around values and purpose um, is it's pretty it, it's pretty clear to everybody what you stand for, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's pretty clear where you stand on a number of different things, um, you know, in terms of right versus wrong, in terms of, you know, do we do the right thing by people or do we take like a more sneaky approach, you know, like just generally it does clear up. It clears up a lot of confusion. It mm -hmm. clears up, I'd say it clears up a lot of stuff that other companies you know, would have a problem with because at the end of the day, running a company that's based around values and purpose is an extraordinary filtering mechanism for who mm -hmm. even comes into the door, mm -hmm. right? Now, mm -hmm. like, you know, and, and and that that also, I mean, I'm not going to kid you, like, I, you know, I'll sit here and lie to you, like, that's not a perfect thing either. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you want to have the sort of the very opposite views. You want to have the conflict. You want to have as sophisticated people, you want to have, you know, the most successful, you want to have the best people who are going to help uh, build your growth, you know, your, your growth engine, you want to have the most successful people, the most mm -hmm. experienced people on product, you want to have the most successful people on biz dev. And so sometimes the, the sort of as a company that is built around a mission and a company that's built around values, Right. As opposed to, hey, we're just going to build this really fun sort of video sharing app. Right. And let's just go out and we don't care what kind of content people are posting. We just want to make sure it goes viral and we want to build that. And, you know, and, and that's it. We want to create this highly addictive app. Well, you can then welcome just about anybody on the planet into, you know, into that, except for maybe people who are really values based. Mm. <laughs> and so. The difference is, is we're quite the opposite of that, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'd say that one of the biggest challenges that we've faced in the in the first three years is actually scaling our team. Mm -hmm. So like we're finally, you know, we finally have gotten to the stage, um, like three years in, where and especially during last year, like we started last year with eight, seven or eight people on the team mm -hmm. full time, and today we're at thirty two. Wow. So like it finally, like last year, in spite of COVID, in spite of everything, last year was really the year where we started to grow, where the team started to grow, where, you know, the, 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 the number of years of experience and the depth of that experience in terms of colleagues, new colleagues signing up, joining was, was just, was, was, was really sort of got, got a big upgrade. Um, and it's really nice because like, we have a very highly motivated team and a lot of the a lot of the folks who may not have as much experience what they lack in experience they make up for in motivation and initiative mm -hmm. but the reality of that is that what ends up happening is you end up having a lot of debt you end up having a lot of technical debt on your engineering team you end up building things on a weak foundation you end up you know constantly wanting to iterate but not necessarily having great plans around it and so we're finally you know or you build something wanting to get to a next stage and maybe you get there but then you're like what's next and you kind of forgot that like okay you might get to the next step but have you thrust five steps forward from there mm 
Mm-hmm. And so like, we're finally getting better at a lot of those things. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that, that, so, so being sort of a values based organization, being an organization that has a very purposeful mission is now actually, I'd say in a way, a breath of fresh air for a lot of people that are kind of coming into the organization. And mm-hmm. that's something that's been missing in their lives, working at other companies. You're singing my song. I love it. I'm going to I'm going to apply. That's it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, OK, so to to be to be perfectly frank, uh, you know, I don't I, I, I feel a little bit like I'm like, yes, everything you just said. And and it feels it feels just a little disingenuous, even though it's not disingenuous. I really wholeheartedly support your mission because it does feel like it's not a if you're not being vegan you're you're directly responsible for killing animals perspective it's more like a hey this is something you can think about and this is something you can dip your your toe in if you will and yet y- y'all are activists all over the place right so one of the things that i love and this is a, a i think maybe a gamified thing that you did is that for every 10 reviews you leave the company will make a donation and i thought that was so I thought it was cool. I thought it was super cool that I got to choose a sanctuary to get my little $10 donation from having given 10 reviews of, of dishes or whatever it was I did first. So what, what, it, it, what role does that sense of play play in the app? Yeah. So we started with this whole idea that's look, you know, we, we want to create an impact. Um, and we think that there's an opportunity here to build a really great pl- company, a really great technology company, a really great um, platform. Um, and we, I just felt like, you know, people are signing up. They're going to be contributing information. That information is valuable. Um, they're going to be spending time in their lives. And how do we how do we enrich that experience and how do we help people kind of connect back this idea, this small idea? So we'll give you a sense of it. Like 65% of our users today are meat eaters. Mm-hmm. Um, 35% of our users are, 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 are vegans and vegetarians. Mm-hmm. And so for the 65% of people, right, I really felt like what, are, what can we do to help kind of create that connection? So they've gone and they've, eaten something vegan or they've bought something that's environmentally friendly and cruelty free. It might be, let's say it could be, you know, a, a, a vegan beauty product, or it could be, um, you know, it could be a, a bag or, you know, a pair of shoes um, that's, that's made without any animals harmed. And so, you know, they share that experience, they share whatever they purchase on, on the platform. They're helping build our community. How do we keep them motivated and how do we gamify it a little bit? And how do we help them see that connection all the way through with what they're buying, with the life that that's impacting. And so that's how we started was if we could just reinforce this and really create a daily sort of habit around them choosing this lifestyle on a more regular basis and we could gamify that and we could do that by connecting them with really impactful causes around the world. And I know that you had Captain Paul Watson on your show recently, mm-hmm. um, but Sea Shepherd is, is one of the organizations that we support, mm-hmm. uh, that we are, we are, we are you know, very, very, very honored to be partnered with them. But so for us, it, was, it, it really it has been this, is, this sense of, okay, how do you help organizations around the world that are creating world-changing, life-changing impact? How do you inspire people and how do you motivate people um, you know, to basically keep going, to, to keep to, 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 to keep trying to live this lifestyle on a more regular basis by kind of gamifying it and at the same time reinforcing it with, hey, look, this is the impact that's being created. So, you know, at the time, the simplest thing that I could kind of come up with was, hey, let's, let's put a little sort of award in people's pockets when they choose vegan. Um, and we chose that to be a dollar. And it's just really simple, right? It's a dollar. And what you can do with that's not a dollar that you get like in an Amazon gift card or that you can go and spend on something, but it's a dollar that we donate to one of our partner organizations. And we have about 65 partners around the world from, you know, ranging from farm animal sanctuaries in places like Argentina 
to organizations like Sea Shepherd, which are really focused on marine life, um, to, you know, to organizations around the world, activist organizations. Um, for instance, we support all three of the uh, farm animal sanctuaries located in South Africa, do a lot of work in South Africa. Um, and it's really just a global movement. Of course, we do a lot of, you know, we have a lot of partners in the U.S. Our closest to you is Woodstock in upstate new york uh, sure. in new paltz and uh, woodstock's been woodstock was one of our earliest partners so yeah we've just been you know just been really focused on on growing that way and growing responsibly that way and it's been amazing i mean I, we've donated over half a million dollars since we first got started to amazing organizations around the world we're now supporting uh children's literacy programs in the developing world so for a dollar you could put a girl in school for a day for a dollar, you can buy a local language children's book for for a kid, uh, you know, in, in, in a poor country. Um, for a dollar, you can plant a tree um, as part of reforestation projects in parts of all of, in parts around the world. Um, for a dollar, actually not even for a dollar, but for 80 cents, you could through the United Nations World Food Program and something called Share the Meal, for 80 cents, you can feed a hungry child three nutritious meals in a day, 80 cents. Wow. Right. So like, we don't even think about 80 cents, right? That doesn't even buy you a pack of gum, but like 80 cents can feed a kid for a whole day. Right. It's an amazing program. And the funny thing about it, most of the meals are plant-based. Most of the meals mm -hmm. are hundred percent plant-based, right. Whenever possible. So, so those, these are the kinds of organizations that we think are making a real impact in the world. They're nonprofits. We want to support them. And a big part of what we do is really connect that our user journey back with that impact that they can create. And I'd say that's one of the, our most unique selling points um, for the platform is, hey, um, you know, we're creating impact in this way. And we're just always working on how do we make this part of sort of the, the platform better. So you mentioned when you get to 10 posts, you get $10 and you get $10 every time you get 10 posts. We actually just remove it. We just remove that barrier. Oh, really? So in the latest, in the latest version, yeah, because we just felt like, hey, uh, you know, the reason we did it when we first started this two years ago was purely administrative. Was, you know, I'm literally sitting there and manually oh. making these donations. Right. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, like, let's, you know, and at the time, in a given week, we were we might have made a couple of a hundred dollars, a couple of hundred dollars of donations. Now that number has grown. Now we're doing, you know, we're doing we're doing like forty, fifty thousand dollars a month that we're donating to organizations around the world, sometimes more. And uh, it, you know, it was just purely administrative. Is how do I manage all of this stuff? Uh, mm -hmm. Manage all these donations and things like that. As especially as we scale the number of partners. Now we have more than sixty. Wow. Um, and so we've gotten better at what we do. We've gotten better at sort of, you know, uh, uh, in, in terms of just building the platform so this stuff can, to some of, to some degree, some of it can be more automated um, and more responsive to the user. Um, so yeah, we just went live with, uh, we just went live with that feature. So it's, you know, for the folks that are listening to the podcast, download the app, take a photo. The next time you go to a restaurant, if you eat something vegan, take a photo of it. It's just like creating an Instagram post. It takes 30 or 40 seconds and boom, you know, we'll put a dollar in your account that you can use to create impact. Um, or if you've got something at home, if you just open your fridge whether it's a bunch of kale or it's a pack of Beyond sausages or it's your favorite vegan butter from Miyoko's or, you know, uh -huh. any other brand, take a photo of it and share it. You're going to help the company because, you know, ultimately that review helps the company. It goes online. It, you know, helps get them more customers in a way. You're going to help that company. Even if the feedback is bad, you're still going to help the company. You're going to help that restaurant. You're going to help other people discover that option um, and make the world a little bit more vegan every single time. And you're going to create impact for a life besides your own. Um, and it's just fun. It's a fun thing to do. Taking a photo, posting it, you know, and really in a way, 
creating impact and logging that on a day-to-day basis. So you have this beautiful sort of view of all of the wonderful vegan, you know, your whole sort of journey around all of this and whether you're vegan already and you're just, you know, using it to record sort of, you know, your, your day-to-day habits and create this kind of impact or, Hey, you know, you want to see and socialize and be part of this community and, and, you know, which is really, really supportive. And we back that up with this amazing little thing that we do, um, which we think is really awesome. I think it's really awesome too. And and there's another benefit that you haven't talked about, which is close to my heart because I'm a writer. And that is that you get to put your writing hat on when you create a review when you write about it and you say that something was scrumptious or you say that it was yeah. delicious or that it needed this or it needed that or or this is what you liked about it, that those reviews, you know, you say something like, I, I don't remember if it's 50 words or 50 characters per review on the, on the app, but the point is that one of the things I love to do is give my, I, I'm a know-it-all, I admit that, and but I love giving my opinion. I love giving my review. I review everything I do. If I go traveling, I review the place. I do a travel guide. If I go to a new restaurant, I take pictures of the food and I review it, and I love talking about it. And so one of the things that the app does is give you the opportunity to have your say, to say it in a way that's really fun and creative, but still to give your opinion on, on what you've experienced. And I, I think that's a really big positive in what you're doing. Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I really appreciate you saying that. Oh, it's, I mean, it's just, it's the truth. And take it from me, as I said, I'm a know-it-all. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I admit that freely. I, there, anybody who's ever met me will go, yes, yeah, she's a know-it-all. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> so... So I I am thrilled and I could I could keep you talking for the next six hours, but I know you have a life to get back to and you have a daughter who's been knocking on the door and wanting your attention. So I, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing how people can find you on social, how people can find the app. And we're going to put it all in the show notes, but I kind of like having it said as well, just because people learn in different ways. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you. Um, so the app, it's just called A Billion, A-B-I-L-L-I-O-N. And that's exactly who we are. We're trying to build a social movement for a billion people uh, that makes the world a lot more sustainable, that you know helps animals, that helps people around the world, that helps people live in a more healthier and more sustainable way, in a happier way, in a more mindful way. So you can download the A Billion app um in either app store and google play or if you have an iphone in in the iphone in the apple app store uh, it's completely free um and it's completely free to use um and uh and we do some really fun things in there there's vouchers from restaurants every now and then there's lots of stuff going around you can engage with businesses you know you'll find that a lot of businesses will respond to feedback um, a lot of companies are starting to jump on board. We've gotten a few thousand companies to, to sort of to jump on board as well. Um, and we just it's just, just a great way to sort of record your daily impact uh, and really find a supportive community uh, around that. So it's called a billion. That's all one word. Um, and we're, of course, you can also go to our website. It's a billion www.abillion.com uh, where you'll find all of the information there if you don't like to use apps. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And then as far as find, finding me, uh, we're also obviously on all socials. So on Instagram, we're a billion, um, and on Twitter, we're a billion app, um, on LinkedIn, I think we're just a billion, but yeah, you can find us on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn. I don't really hang out on platforms like Facebook. I don't have a personal sort of account on, on social media. A billion is the only social media app that I actually use besides LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn as well. I'm Vikas Garg, uh, V-I-K-A-S-G-A-R-G. Um, and I'm based in Singapore. So yeah, look out for me. And if you hear the podcast, please connect with me and let me know. I'd love to get your feedback, love to get your thoughts and love to get to know you better. Oh, that's awesome. And, you know, we didn't really talk about that mindfulness aspect. And now I'm sorry, we didn't, you're going to have to come back again. And we're going to have to get into the nitty and the gritty of that, because there's something very uh, powerful about the mindfulness aspect of feeling like you're in balance. And in fact, if you wouldn't mind talking about that for a second, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what mindfulness is and how it relates to what your what your mission is, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, 
you know, I think that living a life full of values and purpose is 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 something that really can drive mindfulness. I guess the question is, what is mindfulness? Is it's it's having sort of God? I it's like I'm like using I'm using another word to define and define a word, but I'd say it's consciousness. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's having something that grounds you and helps you feel connected and helps you sort of navigate mm-hmm. um, is maybe the best way that I can describe it. And I'm sure that there's other sort of much better people who can define it in a much better way. Mm-hmm. But to me, that's kind of what it is, right? Mm-hmm. And I'd say the, the, the great thing about being vegan is that literally every single decision and choice you make, and there was a Cornell University study 15, 20 years back that talked about how often we make food decisions every single day. And I still, to this day, like, don't understand this number, but like the study said that we make like 200 or 250 food decisions every day. Yeah. Every one of us. Right. And I guess uh, the way that I think about it, maybe it's like, I, you know, I've got a, a, a bottle of water here. It's like every time I decide to take a sip of that water, that probably counts as a food decision. <laughs> but the point is that like, you know, as a vegan um, food is, or somebody who's looking for vegan food um, or wants to eat vegan food, food is constantly on my mind, right? Mm-hmm. What am I going to eat? Where am I going to go? You know, all of this stuff. And I don't think it's too dissimilar for others, but the difference is if when you're vegan, you're looking for vegan food, that's like you're voting with your values every single time, mm. right? Mm-hmm. And it it that's in a way it, that creates a tremendous amount of mindfulness, mm. right? Um, the other thing that I do is is you've I, I found a practice that works for me that creates a lot of mindfulness, and a lot of people have a practice or something that they do. Um, and so you know, like for me, it's it's trying to smile more. Hmm. Uh, a thing that I do that the Dalai Lama does, which has been transformational for me in my life, you know, and, and I don't think that you need to believe in God, um, for anyone who's listening and, and is not religious. I don't think it's so much about believing in God as much as bl- like just sort of blessing somebody or taking a time to sort of acknowledge somebody's presence when you walk into a room or if you're out for a run in the morning or you're just walking around and you see somebody smile at them, or if mm-hmm. that feels weird, because uh, it also probably feels weird to a lot of people to smile at a stranger, right? Smile inside. Or what I do is I take the opportunity to just inside, say something as t- small as God bless you, right? Mm-hmm. Or just bless you. And that little acknowledgement of that person in a positive way for me, not only makes me feel connected, right? But also creates a lot of positivity and mindfulness. So that's what mindfulness is to me. And I'd say my biggest daily practice around mindfulness is just that, is acknowledging people, is just constantly acknowledging people. Um, And I find that sometimes when I deviate away from that, that's when I go to my unhappy place. Wow. Um, So yeah, so that's that that in a way is is sort of what mindfulness means to me. Um, As far as, you know, the platform, it is, again, it's how do we plant the seeds and create a very positive, encouraging environment, and, you know, for search and change social media. So we actually can find opportunities to acknowledge each other, to be mindful of each other, to be respectful, to, to like, you know, to, 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 to really reinforce our daily habits and create better daily habits. And that's, that's mindfulness to us. I love that. It's so my my practice is not to acknowledge them internally. I do this interesting thing where I if I'm out and about, I find someone who I pass in the street at usually almost always a woman to be to be honest, and I compliment her. I will tell her something that I that I think is beautiful about her. And then I walk on. It's not like a it's not like I'm stopping to talk with her or anything. It's just a your eyes are beautiful. And then I move on. And I've had women start crying because uh, they weren't feeling beautiful or they weren't feeling happy. And that that sort of pushed them into this place of being joyful and, and this compliment out of the blues. So that's my practice. And I think I love that you have a practice that that is 
that is less intrusive. <laughs> I feel like I'm probably pretty intrusive when I stop them in the middle of walking down the street to tell them that I like that I like their eyes. Um, so so I have this question that I ask everybody who comes on the show, and it's a silly question. It's the last question. And I find that even though it's a silly question, that it gives poignant answers. And so here's the question. If you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to, to see, what would you say? Oh, <laughs> wow. Interesting question. <laughs> um, oh, man. Um, uh, that's, a that, that's a, that's a very, very good question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would say be kind. I love that. I love, love, love that. And uh, you might be surprised how many people who I really respect who've been on the show, cause I don't have anybody on the show. I don't respect whose answer is be kind. It's it, it is it is so many people like you who are living their values treat kindness as uh, something that's so that's critical, that's crucial uh, in, in the world. So I thank you for that. I really appreciate you saying that because it just reinforces that notion that the people out there like you who are living in that values driven space have kindness at the forefront. Vikas, I'm really grateful that you've taken the time to be here on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it was my pleasure, Isolda, and thank you for reaching out. And it was an absolute pleasure getting to know you today. And thank you for all of the questions. Um, and uh, just uh, delighted to, to be on the show. Hopefully get a chance to see you in, in, back in New York uh, when someday. at some point, <laughs> someday. <laughs> Well, and I someday I, far, who knows when? Yeah, and and uh, I might I might look you up when I go to Singapore because it's on my bucket list for traveling. So, absolutely wonderful. Please awesome. Do. Oh, you have just been listening to Vikas Garg talking about a billion, the app that is starting has started a movement and will hopefully change the world with at least a billion people who are committed to a plant based lifestyle by 2030. This has been the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I have been and will continue to be Isolde Trachtenberg. I thank you for listening. Until next time, this is Isolde reminding you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. <music>for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And if you like what you're hearing, please review it and rate it and let other people know. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, I'd love to meet you on patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I also have lots of exclusive goodies to share just with the show's supporters there. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living in your innovative mindset.